unbothered, unleashed, and totally unscripted. It's Beyond the Roar with football head coach Eddie George. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another great episode of Beyond the Roar with me, Coach Eddie George. And today I have an awesome guest on with me and from Wilmington, North Carolina. It is. Standing six three and a half. No, oh, <laughs> that was when that was in the ninth grade. <laughs> Isn't that great? Now I have the great Clyde Simmons with me. Hey, Clyde, first of all, uh, it's I was a huge fan of you growing up. I grew up in Philadelphia. Right. I grew up an Eagles fan. Yes, uh, my heart was broken in 1980 when he lost to the Raiders, and then they were really bad. And then when right around 1988, 89, that's when the Buddy era, Buddy Ryan era occurred. He bought you and uh, Reggie White and Jerome Brown. I mean, that, that defensive line was vicious. A different brand of football back then. Definitely different brand. Definitely different brand. Uh, you know, back then, I would be now in today's game probably a three-tech. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and then I was an in, you know, like mm-hmm. 280, 285. At the highlight, heaviest part of my career, but today's game, you know, it's so much faster. But then it was so much more pound run game and all the stuff. Yeah. Throwing the ball as much. Yeah, yeah. And you were drafted in the seventh round. No, ninth round. Ninth round. Ninth round draft choice. Yeah, they didn't. They don't have those many now. But yeah, I yeah. Was a ninth round pick. Uh, I had those those three first rounders playing with them: uh, Reggie, Mike Pitts, uh, Jerome Brown. Uh, so it was always a challenge for me just because, oh, you got these first-rounders with me and all this stuff. But it was just fun competing. Yeah. You know, we, that's one thing we always did, you know. We loved each other, competed against each other. But the number one thing was, you know, who's going to get there first? Yeah. And that's what drove us about trying to make plays. Probably. We celebrated each other, but it was a lot of competition in that group. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, when you think about it, Reggie White. First of all, and then Jerome, you and my, what did you learn from that experience, and, and how did you translate that into your coaching career and your philosophy? Well, what I learned from it was that it doesn't matter where you come from, mm-hmm. uh, because you know Reggie went to Tennessee, Mike Pitts went to Alabama, Jerome was University of Miami, and I went to Western Carolina. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you get in there in that group, especially when I came in as a young player. When, we had Greg Brown, Kenny Clark, and um, yeah. Tom Strellis, some older cats. They taught me the right way about playing football. It wasn't all this glamour and glitz that it is now. It's uh, getting after people. Mm. You, know, you make sure you understand that this has got to be a physical game all the time. Yeah. And you can't lay off and you ain't got no friends when you're playing. Yeah. So after the game, yeah, you can shake hands and be cordial with each other. But through the course of a game, I don't like you and you don't like me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nah, yeah. What I learned from those guys was that because they went to big schools and they always had guys that was always more talented than where I went to school at. So competing was part of what they do. You know, when you, mm-hmm. in a sense, the big fish, sometimes you forget that you got to compete. Mm-hmm. And coming in as a as a smaller guy then, coming in with those guys who are already established. Jerome came a year after I left, got there, but – Coming in with those guys who are already established, you start understanding that, hey, every day you got to go out there and compete. Mm-hmm. You know, one of, my, one of our frat brothers used to tell me all the time, you know, hey, man, if I don't hunt, I don't eat. And that, yeah. that mentality, you eat what you kill. That's right. That's and, right. That's right. Uh, and one thing that I took from it was like, you know what, hey, I got to prove myself every day. Yeah. And the minute you stop proving yourself, it's the minute time for you to leave. Yeah, you know the I guess in essence that your brand of football has is my brand of football is we come from the kind of the same tree, and um, I, I do recall you know uh, the games I watched when I played Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> there were it was something called uh, you know Bounty Bowl, Bounty Bowl, Bowl yeah, uh, all kind uh, of yeah, all kind of stuff that goes all into that. But but that's that was that was accepted by, back then and it was a way of life it was that's how you that's how you got an advantage that's this you know it was always those hidden treats i would say yeah hidden treats um it wasn't nothing to dump somebody on their shoulder 
on the head or something like that, get him out of the game. He ain't trying to maim him or cripple him, just get him out of the game. Right. See the next guy. You know, right. Because there's a reason why they're starters. That's right. They're better than the guy behind <laughs> That's them. right. That's right. So, you know, you always trying to say, you know what, it ain't personal. Mm-hmm. It ain't vicious. It's just the way the nature of the game is a violent game. Mm-hmm. And what I try to teach in my players is that it is a violent game. Yes. Even though it's faster now, they're more gifted athletes, I think, personally, than we were. Uh, they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. But I don't think they're as violent. But the game has changed because the rules have made a change that you can't mm-hmm. do the same thing. You know, prime example is a guy like Chuck Cecil. You know, he got suspended later on for the same hit that glamorized what the NFL became. That's right. A violent game, but – it's a fun game. I don't want to take nobody ever think that it's not. But the way they protect, I'm all about the protection of it. But understanding that it's still a violent game. Mm-hmm. And you have to protect yourself at all times when you're inside of those white lines. And if you don't, you're going to get hurt. Now, when you came to Tennessee State, um, what was, I guess, the most surprising thing that you saw out of your defensive line group or just the overall experience that kind of, maybe threw you off guard a little bit, or a surprise, I mean, a, a, a glamorous, I guess, a surprise. I would say they're watching them on tape. I thought they was pretty decent as a front. Uh, as they gotten in better shape, they're better athletes than I thought they were. Um, for example, Teray Jones, yeah, really quick, really explosive when he does it all the time. My problem right now is he ain't figured out what's all the time and, you know, He's trying to save himself and not play the way I want him to play because he thinks that the guy behind him, he doesn't trust that yet. And my thing is don't worry about those things. Go as hard as you can for as long as you can, and we'll get somebody in and get, some, get you a blow, and then we get the next guy up. Mm-hmm. But he's an example of and That's just one of the many guys that can be in there that are really good football players, mm-hmm. but they still learning. And that's that's because we're so young. I mean, yeah. I, think the, I think the oldest guy in there is a – is we got I mean, one senior. He's graduating in May, and he may get a chance to come back. So, wow. So we'll see. No, no, no question. I think um, when I look back uh, at the at their defense, at our defense, excuse me, mm-hmm. uh, their ability to knock people off the ball, you know, that brand of football. Um, at this point in time in the season, um, we've I think given up one touchdown in six or seven quarters. Something like that. Something yeah, like that. yeah. Something I mean, this, I can't remember exactly. What yeah, it was, something like and that. And I think that's and that's one thing that you know, I believe in is the trench play on both sides of the football. If you can't dominate the line of scrimmage, you're not dominating games. That's 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 that shit is cute yeah, is. in September and October. Especially, you know, when the weather's nice and you're throwing the ball all over the yard and you're pretty and you're fresh, but when you get late October, early November. <laughs> run the ball. Yeah, yeah, and stop the run. And stop yeah. The run. So, um, what are your what's your your initial thoughts of the era of football that we're playing now? You mentioned the rules change. Is it softer? Is it right line right now? Is I mean personally, now that my sons are playing, I'm glad it's a little yeah. a little bit softer it, now. It is. I, I think for me, I, I'm I'm glad it's safer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still think there's some things that's inherited football that the game is naturally violent the game is naturally you got to attack people and all this stuff but when they started making the contact above the shoulders or certain targeting issues and that stuff and I I get it there's sometimes where you got to protect underprotected people Mm -hmm. but it has made it so that certain positions mainly the quarterback is almost untouchable So if you used to be, you got one full step and you can unload. Mm -hmm. You know, granted there'll be somebody taking two steps. It's always that that, that fine line that you're calling in there. But now if you don't tackle him above the knee and below the shoulders, it's a foul. (laughs) Right. And, And so you have to adjust and learn how to tackle him differently. And you know, it's almost made the point of trying to script the ball with hands over top, stripping the ball. It's almost, almost illegal because it used to be a time where you script the ball, and because we're bigger men and all the stuff, momentum naturally takes you, and you end up falling in certain ways and all yeah. that stuff. 
And a lot of people like myself learn how to do that really well. Yeah. You know, so you end up bumping somebody on the shoulder now and then. Yeah. It don't tear it up, but it's enough to get the next guy up. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And to gain this game, <laughs> you know, I would, I tell people all the time, I say, shoot, man, with this game, I, I'd have lost a lot of money. A lot of money. You wouldn't be playing. They, you wouldn't get kicked out of the league. They would have, they would have, you know, because <laughs> it was some things, you know, it wasn't vicious, malicious. It was just natural play of the physicality of the game. Right. And what you try to do is punish your opponent as much as they was trying to punish No, you. no question at all. No question at all about that. Um, so we're going to move to halftime real quick. We had a, a fun uh, Tennessee State fun fact I want to ask you about. Um, let's see if you get the answer. You ready? I'm going to try. All right, here we go. Which football coach convinced Ed Tall Jones to give up on basketball to focus on football? Was it A, Howard Gentry, B, Johnny Merritt, or C, Joe Gilliam Sr.? I'm going to say Joe Gilliam Sr. because I was thinking that he was around the time. I remember his son playing. I'm thinking they're around the same era because – Joe Let's put a wager on this. Um, let's. You got to give me fifteen strokes. Ah, you're killing me. <laughs> fifteen strokes. If you get this wrong. Oh man, you already beat me when I gave you six. How you going to give you fifteen? I hadn't played in months. Me neither. <laughs> me neither. Me neither. I tell you what. I tell you what. I tell you what. Eight strokes. Eight. I'll give you eight. I'll All right. Eight. I'll take those eight because it's Johnny Barrett. B. <laughs> I thought John A. Merritt retired like in the 60s. Hey, he convinced him. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? You took a loaded gun. <laughs> hey, I'll take it. I'm going to need it because I tell you what, after the season, we're going to hit those links. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to get those absolutely. links. So we share um, a same fraternity. I'm relatively new in, into it. Yeah. Uh, being here on at the HBCU campus, coaching here, um, does, it has, does it have a different meaning to you right now, now that you're coaching and what is it? What is the, the the vibe like for you now? I watch these young brothers walking around campus and all that stuff. You know, you know how I am. I like to watch and just just see people behave and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And it's very similar to where it was when I was in school. You know, the fraternity, the, the friendship, and all the stuff that goes along with the fraternity. Um, and watching these young men, you know, carry themselves, and they doing way more community stuff than we did. Now, but it's different school and stuff, but. That's what I write, like watching in there, watching mm-hmm. these cats being, you know, the true gentleman of Omega. Omega Sci-Fi, fraternity, in case we got to clarify that. And, uh, the Omega Sci-Fi. Yes. So I like watching them do those things. Yes. You know, and, you know people all get hyped up about the step shows and all that stuff, and I tell them. Could that, you set out a hop for them? No. I, I haven't <laughs> hop since, since 1986. <laughs> so wow. That's the last time and the last time I will ever, ever hop. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was, um, you know, just watching these young men, you know, watching them carry themselves like good men and mm-hmm. like being conscious of the community and all those things right there. That's huge for me you mm-hmm. know, because all people hear about is, is the, the barking, the, all the stuff that goes yeah. on with the fraternity, but they don't see the good side of it. They mm-hmm. These men about, um, you know, creating a, a, a wealth of community for these people. Is it? Does it mean something special to you to be coaching at an HBCU? Or is it just the, the brand itself that just comes along with it? You know, yeah. when I came out of school, that was there were five schools that really offered me a scholarship, and I chose Western mainly because of my coach went to Western. But the other four, or the other three out of the other four were HBCUs. Mm-hmm. Um, I was excited about the opportunity there, you know, just because – history that goes with each university that it was mm-hmm. and it wasn't Tennessee State for one of them but you know they, you know, they weren't gonna come wait in Wilmington North Carolina to see yeah, right, right. like me but I think it's a special I do mm-hmm. think it's special because there's a lot of good football players that come through HBCUs mm-hmm. and we have to always remind remind yourself that just because they play at HBCU don't mean they're not a good football player. I see a ton of uh, NFL Hall of Famers a ton of them. from HBCUs exactly. like Goats Jerry Rice, uh, Walter Payton, exactly. to stop, you know what I mean? Exactly. So it's not like just some guys, like no, no. greatest of all time. So I definitely agree with you there. So we're going to get into some more um, personal stuff, you know, more on the, the fun side. What is your favorite quote? Favorite quote? Ah, oh. oh, that's a tough one. 
you know, because I, I, I steal lines all the time. You know, every, <laughs> I, 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 are your favorite line? What's your boy. current line? I think I know it, but uh, I, I can't say it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something else. I, 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 right now, I, I, I got a thing going on with my players now. I tell them I'm, I'm, I'm going through a, a transition right now, a moment of transition. You caught me at a, a key point in life, and I may be uh, stating it wrong just because I'm, I'm a little bit all over the place right now. But uh, sorry. Uh, it's it's a move. It's a line from Pulp Fiction when um, Samuel Jackson's in the restaurant and he says, oh, "Ringo, yeah. you caught me at a moment of transition." Normally. Your blankety blank would be dead as fried chicken, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I just add a little right, 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 so right. That's the going line right now. So I'm, I'm in a moment of transition. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, show you show mercy and patience. Yeah, that's what I tell. You. Now you don't you don't strike me as a man that that's fearful. But what is your biggest fear? Um, failing these young men. Mm. Um, you know, I take a lot of pride in what what I do. I want to teach them to be the best. I want to teach them to to understand that it's more to it than just playing football. Yeah. Um, regardless of whatever level you go to, because it's high school, it's college, or it's the pros, it ends. And a lot of times these young men don't realize that it ends. And they don't value the, the, uh, the time that they have as in when you get to play. So when you cherish in these moments of playing, because college it ends for some, some are lucky enough to go on and play like we did in the professional. Right. But for the most part, it ends. And then what are you going to do afterwards? Are you prepared for the, your next point of your life? Because when it does end, you're still a relatively young man. And, it, and for me, it was I was 36. Mm. And that's a long time for us a football player. But in life, I was that's a young, young man. Yeah. So, you know, just getting them to understand that football is a part, understanding that you got to keep progressing and moving towards your life goals and what you want to be. Mm -hmm. I just try to make these, help these young men be better men, one day be better fathers. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I keep telling them, I'm not your daddy. I'm just mm -hmm. an older cat talking to a younger cat. Yeah. That's it. You know, um, I when I started coaching and what I've learned and, and I'm still learning is that, this is a personal development program, but it's just run through football. We're teaching them life skills. We're teaching them principles. We're teaching them responsibility. All of the corny stuff that I learned that I was beating into me as a player, I'm like, okay, here we go. Discipline and uh, being on time and being prepared and be professional. And exactly. now I'm on the other side. I'm like, yeah, you got to do these things, right? Now you really have to do it. You got to do it. Yeah, and it keeps you accountable. Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, most times as you know, I, I, I work with a guy who's always like 99% of the people want to do right. Mm -hmm. It's always that 1%. And that 1% is the ones that you got to try and either corral them and get them to join the 99 or get rid of them, the money, as yeah. in the football side no of question. it. question. You still want to help them as a person, mm -hmm. but – when it boils down to it, there sometimes there's going to be people. And, we, and the hardest thing about, I think, as in the coaching, because we always feel like we can touch everybody. Mm -hmm. And the hardest thing about coaching and all the stuff is that you can't. Right. And you have to realize that sometimes you can fight and fight and fight and fight, but this guy right here ain't willing to fight. You can't fight for him. And that's the hardest part about coaching for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what I've learned, too, is – you know, I've had to let go of a couple of players because they just won't follow the rules. And you almost want to give them second and third chances. But at some point, you got to cut your losses because it will affect and undermine the whole plan of what you're trying to do. Exactly. It's culture. You know, if you build the right places, even the guys who are stubborn, if everybody's doing it right, mm -hmm. they fall in line. They follow, they follow the lead. And, you know, we developing young leaders out there. I see some sure. guys that are stepping up. You know, you ain't always got to be the vocal guy right. to be a leader. So Let's lead by example. Exactly. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about another passion of yours. Golf is one. Mm -hmm. uh, two is eating. Okay. We eat, we eat every day at the lunch hall. Yes, I do. So, so um, what are your top three fast food chains? 
Ah, oh, man. Top three. Because I, I, mean, I really don't eat a lot of fast food, but I do like fast food. Well, well, you know what? It, it, what would it be? I guess you're your go-to. Well, my go-to would probably would be... Because I got some feuds going on with some other, some other, some some change. The restaurant we're not gonna get into that right now. <laughs> but I would say it'd be Wendy's, Ooh. probably be one. You know. Now, what from Wendy's? Then that's that's uh, key. Now, now for me is 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 the chicken sandwich. Ooh, it's the chicken sandwich. Mm. Now they, the home style crunchy joint. I like the home style crunchy, but I think that that Cajun because it's not too spicy. It's, but just, it's just right. enough it's heat right. for me because, yeah. you know, if it's too hot, I, I can't stand it. Mm-hmm. Um, it depends on where I'm at. Bojangles, Popeyes, you know, like that. So, you know, it depends Ooh. where I'm at because I'm, I'm, I'm a Bojangles guy. Yes. You know, mainly because of them them them, uh, them them biscuits, you know, them, them cinnamon raisin biscuits. The, bo- the, the Bojangles. The, the, bo- the Berries. The yes. Bowberry biscuits, right? Uh-huh. That's mainly because of that. I like Popeyes too because my son, you know, he likes that that spicy chicken too much for me. Uh-huh. It's too much, but my youngest son, he loves it. You know, the spicier the better. Yeah, I can't, yeah, I'm like, yeah. Dude, I can't eat that. But uh, I would say those are like two A, two B. Um, and surprisingly enough, Sonics. Sonics got some good food. Surprisingly enough, Sonics. I like the hot dog. So the hot dog from Sonic. Yeah. You said the chicken sandwich from Wendy's mm-hmm. and the biscuits from Bojangles, yeah, but the chicken right. from Popeye's. Yeah, that's right. Now, for me, okay. it would have to be. Now, Wendy, I will agree, hands down, Wendy's has the best burgers out of all of them. They do have the Baconator yeah, is a, serious. A great burger. A great uh, burger. Over all of them. Five Guys, McDonald's. You got me on that burger, one. Burger. Bet without a doubt. You got me on that. Yes, on bang. That. The fries though, McDonald's, McDonald's. I will agree with you wholeheartedly because McDonald's fries are some of the best fries ever. Ever. Period. Same grease. But that's one of the ones I'm feuding with. Right oh, now. see, I, yeah, yeah. And it has nothing to do with the brand of McDonald's. It has to do with one store. With just one store. One store, and I won't go to not another one. So I'm hoping McDonald's might see this. Like, this right we hear that yeah. Mickey D's. Yeah, you got to get on this good side. All right. Um, so let me ask you this: Is loyalty or trust more important? Mm. I think loyalty is because trust is earned, and I think once you get loyalty, the trust would naturally come to it. Um, you start off by I always start off by giving people respect anyway. And then the more you respect, the more you start to trust each other and all the stuff. You start telling and talking about things right there. And you trust that I'm going to say the right things and trust mm-hmm. I'm going to do the right things by you. And I trust you're going to do the right things I tell you to do as a coach. But loyalty is one of those things where, it's, you know what, you have built trust, you have done all of those things, and then it naturally grows and builds. Because, you know, if you do the right things by people, I think they'll follow you anywhere as a leader. Mm-hmm. Um, is when you are half in, half out. Uh, why should I follow him? Because he half in, half out. He ain't all in. Right. So why should I follow him? Right. And I think that's my thing is about loyalty is that it's, it's a growing thing. But trust is earned. You don't just walk up and just trust somebody with it without doing stuff in there. Right. So, but, you know, for me, no one thinks loyalty because I think trust is earned. How will your friends describe you? Um... Well, how would your friends describe you? Well, it depends on who you're talking to and where you're talking to. Right. They all going to say pretty much the same stuff. You know, if they know me since I was in, like younger in high school and all the stuff, he was quiet, mm-hmm. he was uh, uh, laid back, he's that kind of stuff. I still am fairly laid back. I ain't as quiet as people think I am. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing about it is, and – um Especially when I was playing, you thought I was a mute or something where I played and all the stuff because I didn't say a lot. But as I got older and all the stuff, you know, finding your voice and all the stuff and finding what you're passionate about, and you start doing things. But for now, for me, uh, you know, because, you know, you get older, you start understanding that, you know, mm-hmm. what, say what you mean, mean what you say. Yeah. And my friends would probably say, yeah, he says what he means. He means what he says. Yeah. Uh, you know. Loyal, um, one of those guys that we, 
you know, give you a shirt off his back yep. if you need it and all that stuff. Hey, feed you. Yeah. You know, all of the things that you would do for a friend, you know, mm-hmm. that's what I think they would say about me. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely agree with all of that. And you love um, the uh, the liver, right? <laughs> you love the liver here, it's good, right? Pretty damn good, right? Yeah, with a pork yeah. chop. Liver with a pork chop. I'm going to go with the liver because that pork chop is a little bready for me, but, you know, but it's pretty tasty. But that liver, boy, woo! Yeah, that, mm. the, the fried shrimp for me is everything. Yeah. yeah, I'll kill 30 of those at a time. Okay, we're entering our two minute, ra- two minute warning rapid fire questions. All right, you ready? I'm going to try. Uh, country or city? I think I'm going to answer that one. Wow. Hold on, you got rapid fire. You say, I'd rather live in the country or be in the city. Country or city? Dang, that's hard. All right, I'm going to say city. Mm. Broccoli or green beans? Broccoli. Okay, I don't know why this matters, but uh, it's on here. Uh, does the toilet paper go over or under for you? Over. Yeah, you got to pull. Actually, under. Though. How you going to pull up? It's pulling up. No, nah, just pull down. Pull down. Over, over, down. Over, over. Hold on. Down. Over is this way. Over is down. Right, over is down. Yeah, pull down. Nah, but pull, you, you, pull, pull, it you pull it this way or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Waffle House or IHOP? Waffle House. Why? I think they pancakes are so much better. Oh, the waffles are so much better. And then they got cheese eggs. They do it the right way. Not oh, that cheese man. just throwing on but, top of okay, it. Okay, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Waffle House is serious. Cheese grits, you get that. I mean, the the sandwiches, great. But that daggone French toast slam from IHOP, bacon, egg, sunny side up, French toast slam. Come, dog, there's nothing better than that. Oh, I'm going to have to try that because I never had the French toast slam. The French toast slam? Because, you know, when I go to IHOP, I just normally get me the, the, just a large stack and some bacon. And that's it. Because I ain't really a big fan of IHOP. But I'm going to try the, what do you call it again? French toast stack? French, French toast slam. All right, that's, that, that's number Trust one of my on tasks to do once I find an IHOP. All right, and finally, queso or salsa? Queso. With ground meat? Without absolutely, absolutely, without. got to have the ground meat. Absolutely, ground meat. <laughs> absolutely. Well, my brother, thank you for joining me on another great episode of Beyond the Roar with me and Coach Clyde Simmons. My guy, my man. My Blessings guy. to you, man. Until next time, stick around next week. Hopefully, we'll be cheering on, talking about some championships, possibly. So we'll see. Until next time, stick around. See you later.